Hello and welcome to today's feature presentation. Coffee Cakes presents the first annual Visual Novel Double Feature. The only show on YouTube where we look at the latest and greatest in the great land of Nippon's most obscure genre, the horny moving picture. Ah. Tonight we have two wonderful little titties spanning the only two parts of my brain, anime bullshit and wholesome cute vibes. Yes, everyone, please join me as I ramble about two of my current hypofixations, and for once, I amn't alone! <laughs> Ladies and gentle frogs, please let me introduce you to my co-host for the evening, the master of horror and all things jank, Demenza's Gate! Uh, wait a second, where are we? What the hell is going on here? I only came because he told me there would be free beer. That, my stupid friend, was a lie. Cue the intro. You know, as a kid, I was never really much of a reader. Like, I mean, I read all the stuff school told me to read, which maybe sort of turned me off being a massive bookworm later in life. Which is funny seeing how I have a fucking English degree. But even today, I'm not really much of a book person. Dunno why, but I just can't really focus on them very well. More of an audiobook person, to be honest. I think it's probably due to me being a bit more audio focused and visual when it comes to experiences, which kind of would explain my early obsession with video games niche genre, visual novels. Growing up, I got a lot of flack over the weird shit I grew obsessed with from my friends. While they were more busy playing Call of Duty, I was more excited about the release of, like, another Code R on the Wii, which is absolutely excellent, by the way. Something about the use of on-screen visuals and sound to accompany a narrative really just presses a happy juice button in my brain, especially if they are accompanied by a sleek UI, memorable character design, and some good-ass low-key background music. The genre, though, is, uh, well, it's vague to say the least. It has a lot of crossover and similarities with the popularity of adventure games of the 1980s. Hell, you could even link it back as far as, like, text adventures like Zork. And hey look, you can even play that in Call of Duty. Take that, stupid old friends. I was right! I'd say stuff like Secret of Monkey Island and Sam and Max were established from a more American viewpoint of the genre, focused solely on narrative exploration, while visual novels came from a more Japanese vibe. Though obviously there's crossover. I mean, hell, Kenji Anno's early work is deeply influenced by more ethereal first-person adventure games like Myst, so it's all just kind of a cool, text-heavy melting plot. My personal favourite example is a studio like Sing, that used a mix of a more Japanese style of character writing and art, and blended kind of a more puzzle solve adventure game feel. They made games like Trace Memory and Hotel Dusk. Sadly, they're no longer around anymore, but you can still feel their influence strong today. So in my opinion, there's no real way to actually distinguish a massive difference between the two vibes anymore, really. Not like you really should, regardless. Hell, a new studio like Chuko Games proves this on, like, a very fundamental level. Helmed by industry veterans like Kazutaka Kodaka and Kotaro Ukatashi, two people who essentially popularized the deck game trope in visual novels over the last decade, now coming together to make a new studio that is attempting to prove visual novels can be just about anything. From puzzle platformers, FMV, and hell, even going back to their aesthetic roots, full-on anime series. So with all that being said, today I'd like to look at two games that have absolutely no thematic or aesthetic link, but both are attempting to do some rad shit in the visual novel adventure game space, despite at times even being classified as either. Thirteen Sentinels, Agus, I guess, sorry, and an, an I guess what? So like, dang yo, Villaware is a weird ass studio. Like, they've been around since 2002, only made like seven or so games, and produced some of the most visually stunning titles on the market, yet still are somehow around in our hell year of 2020. I mean, I'm not complaining. They're one of those studios that just takes a long time to develop a single title, but when they show up, they show up. Believe it or not, their latest release was Dragon's Crown, back on the PS3, but they've been cracking out remasters of both It and Odin's Fear on the PS4 for the last gen, so they haven't actually had an entirely new release since, um, uh, 2013. Damn. Well, that all changed this year with the release of 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim. Aegis, Aegis Rim. I don't know, which may take this year's dumbest name award for that one. Nah, it makes sense narratively. It, sort of. Like a lot of stuff in this game. So, um, let me know when this plot description starts to sound familiar to you guys. 
13 Sentinels Aegis Rim tells the story of a group of Japanese teenagers who are destined to save the world from an incoming kaiju invasion. True, you guessed it, piloting mechs. But as these things go, things are not what they first may seem. Also, there's magical girl talking cats, cute aliens who want to return home, time-traveling androids, idols who sing to mechs, giant spider aliens, Bansho pompadour hotheads, literally the entire plot of Sukubam Deka, verbatim, and tits! Yeah, 13 Sentinels may be the most trope-heavy and media-influenced game I've ever played, but therein lies its brilliance in how it utilizes these tropes to tell honestly one of 2020's most bizarre, confusing, and captivating stories. First of all, needless to say, the game looks absolutely remarkable. Vanillaware once again back at it with their insane level of craft on display. Showing off individually drawn characters and backgrounds to scream lazy 80s afternoons, sleek futurescapes, and cozy interiors. The sheer level of visual polish on display ranges on showboating. Like, god damn, look at these background NPCs. Each one of them looks like they should have their own game. The game's general aesthetic has, like, a look that is distinctly anime, but blended with Vanillaware's wonderful voice. Seen you how they animate faces, individual running and walking frames, and impeccable lighting. This nostalgic yet vibrant atmosphere is helped by an excellent score that ranges from ethereal choir chants to lo-fi, ridge racer-ass battle themes that just get me going. The game is essentially split into three gameplay sections, accessed easily through this snazzy little menu here, each section having different percentages you need to clear. The game is made up of what I'd say is about 60% visual novel, in which you play through 13 distinct stories which are each told by a separate character, all of which feed into each other and loop around in some wild ass ways. The other 40% is made up of you playing the game's combat mode, seeing you actually take to the battlefield and attack the invading kaiju head on in a tactical RPG mode that sees you playing through various missions to both unlock secret files on the game's characters, but also have to be completed in order to further unlock character story modes that are blocked off. With these three separate game modes, the game makes sure you play each part out of order. Much like how the narrative itself is pretty much out of order, placing a heavy emphasis on the fluidity of reality, dreams, memory, and time, creating a really weird narrative flow that I've never quite seen before in anything. It's all very dense and interlooping, which helps that the game actually has a really good fast-forward function that stops at new dialogue. It has a helpful timeline map and a story timeline breakdown for every scene in their respective place in the game's weird-ass approach to time. What is really cool, though, is how each character's story actually plays and feels completely different. One may see you shooting witches with a magical gun you got from a talking cat, while another may see you in a never-ending time loop in a train station looking for a key. The game even uses the UI and characters' contextual narrative choices to differing effects, letting every character character's journey feel like they actually added a new layer to each twist and turn. It's really cool and helps the already huge cast stand out in their own ways. To be honest, the cast is really what sells the game. Made up of pretty much every anime trope you could possibly think of, expressed lovingly through both impeccable character designs that span the looks from 1980s anime schoolgirl to far future twinks, but also in how excellent the game's English dub is. Plenty of dangs, hex, and random English VAs shouting senpai thrown in for good measure. Even further developing and making some of the more fanservice-y stuff more contextually interesting to Western players without losing the original charm. It's some really neat stuff, and they really went above and beyond for localizing an otherwise very textually Japanese game. Sam Muller, director of production at Sega, actually spoke in great detail about the challenge of bringing this game's story to the West, which I've linked in the description, which you should super read because it's a really interesting story, but specifically I'd like to mention how not only did they have the regular issue of translation, but also recording lines during a worldwide pandemic. It's shocking how weirdly resident and thematic this struggle was in regards to the game's actual themes of like viruses, mechanically orchestrated disasters, and worldwide epidemics. It's really weird, and it's great that they actually got it out the door despite, you know, the world ending. These recording issues aside though, the game's cast stepped up to the challenge and made the already wonderful localization all the better. Made up of some of the most popular voices in the industry at the moment. Hell, even Cassandra Morris shows up. Though, weirdly not as a cat, and there's a cat in this game. Hello Fluffy from 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim. Hello Morgana from Persona 5.
With all that being said, I can't say the game's more combat-heavy side actually helps the game's narrative stand on its own. Sure, it's cool to actually see what these mech versus kaiju battles looked like, and they do some cool stuff with music and character interactions, but overall the combat sequences come off as feeling quite boring and disconnected to the story's bigger picture. What makes matters worse is the tactical combat just isn't very fun to play. Not that the combat is simple or anything, I mean there's plenty of upgrade trees, level ups, systems of who you take into battle and who stays on the defence lines, but it never really came down to more than just choosing six pilots and equipping the stuff that just worked the best for the mission. It's also hampered by a really cool looking but hard to read map design and UI, and you're just sort of left with a bare bones and not very tactical tactical RPG. Great presentation, but hampered by a story that honestly didn't need it. Part gorgeous side-scrolling visual novel, part bad tactical RPG, 13 Sentinels is a game that is split into two halves that make up a mostly good whole, but leaning more on the former than the latter. As sort of lame as the tactical combat is, I honestly can't express how wonderful the game's interconnected jumble of events ends up being, and would super recommend you give it a shot if you're in any way a fan of other mind-bending visual novels like Virtue's Last Reward or Danganronpa. And sure, while not 100% a visual novel, it certainly has the feel of one, and is by far one of the best ones that released this year. Listen, all of this sounds cool or whatever, but I was told there would be frogs. Hello, yes, it is I, Frog Coffee Ribbit. So frogs are pretty cool, and games have a weird amount of them, huh? Slippy, those river weirdos from Ocarina of Time, and like, Frog, from Chrono Trigger, but it's rare to ever actually see them get their own titles. Until now! The Frog Detective is a new adventure game series developed by Grace Buxner and co-produced by, um, Super Hot? Super Hot. Super Hot. Each game revolves around the frog himself, solving mysteries in various delightful locations, vibing with cool animals, and usually ending in a dance party. In the original, he solved a puzzling case of a haunted island full of scientists, finding the source of the spooky noises while meeting a colourful cast of characters along the way. This time, the detective has found himself tasked to solve the case of a destroyed parade to celebrate a new villager in a small magical town in the countryside. He must find out who the perp was and the whereabouts of the titular invisible wizard herself. So if you may have noticed, I have a guest today, because on Dem's channel we looked at the first game in the series, yeah. The Haunted Island, a frog detective game. So we gone look at the sequel that expands upon the wonderful little man and his journey to a magical village to figure out Frog Detective 2, The Case of the Invisible Wizard. So, as I was saying earlier, the more western approach to adventure games of the 1990s, like Monkey Island or Grim Fandango, are more applicable here to Detective Frog. Though specifically the game harkens back to like, a weird mix of early Telltale games like Sam and Max, and Strong Bad's cool game for attractive people, but also the weird ass edutainment games of humongous entertainment. Shit like Put Put, Spy Fox, and Fatty Bear are all sort of vibe with Detective Frog's anthropomorphic characters, but also its wholesome yet irreverent tone. Humongous in its wholesome vibes, yet hilarious in its weird, off the beat mood. Hell, I mean, just look at the goddamn graphics menu. In general though, Froggy 2 is a huge step up from the original in just about every single way. It's for one, about two times longer, clocking in at around two-ish hours, and has a way bigger cast who all interact and flow back to the central mystery along with their actions of the night of the case. Alongside this greater interweaving of the cast, Froggy now even has a little journal where he stores notes on the suspects, collectible items, and you can even decorate it with stickers. I love stickers! But the stickers actually sort of feed into the game's larger use of multimedia for its art style. The whole game has a sort of a low-poly PS one vibe to the characters, reminiscent to something like Mega Man Legends, but in a newer sense, like something like Lovely Planet would be a good description. It got that simplistic, cutesy look, but also kind of reminded me of like Play Doh or Plaster Scene models, mixed in with weird world images of dogs and stuff to add like a sort of haphazard multimedia vibe to the game. As Dem said in his video, it reminds me a lot of kids playing with random toys that didn't really fit in aesthetically, but that's half the charm. Hell, I remember when I was a kid, I used to cut up pictures from toy catalogs and paste them onto other stuff to pretend I had the toys. So I super vibe with the visual style that the Froggy series is going for. Along with the sort of haphazard vibe to the game's presentation, the lack of voice acting actually adds to that in my opinion. It's doing a similar thing to like, Later Alligator or even Hatchet for Boyfriend. Well half the fun is actually thinking up the various voices for these weirdos. I actually streamed the game with some friends and we all ended up doing different parts, adding stupid character details and 
shit that made it overall a lot more fun. Speaking of this cast, however, it includes some wonderful lads and lasses that I would be remiss not to talk about, including... Nani! A maybe crazy high-pitched lady who just wants the town to look nice. Victor! A rude little lad who soaks and sucks. Mandy! A chain-smoking broad who's got a passion for fashion. Mary! A musical madman with a love of singing and extortion. Susan! A country belle who's got a lovely house. Carlos! A chill poppy with a rad store. Ralph! A pirate with an Irish accent who reminds me of someone. Friends, that's gonna do it. And, um, the rest. Like, hey man, what's happening here? Now hold on a moment, sir. I know the two of them, they're friends. What happened? Uh, I don't believe this. I see. Nuska Muikkunen. Hey, Muumi Peikko. Give me that. Did you catch a game last night? Mm -hmm. Is it still hot out there? Video games sure can be pretty neat, eh? I mean, just now we get some mech games about sadness and death mixed with a cute cheery game about a handsome frog fella that I would very much like to hold. You see, despite what the mainline industry might think, not every game needs to be Assassin's Creed or dang old Call of Duty gunman. Sometimes instead what you just need is a, a frog or a intense depression. You Or, maybe you just need some delicious looking bug snacks to gobble up and turn your arm into a curly fry. My point here is, video games sure can offer us a lot of experiences that are neat as heck, as long as you're willing to walk off the beaten path a little bit to find them. Personally, I love finding obscure little neat gems made by small studios these days a lot more than I do playing whatever flavor of live service game is the fresh hot squeeze of the week these days. It's more fun to be surprised by things that you've never seen before, even if the presentation isn't 100% or the gameplay has some issues, or the game itself is virtually non-existent. Like, look, I won't try to pretend Frog Detective has a particularly deep gameplay system. I mean, you're not gonna be S-ranking fools or putting them into a combo or anything like it's DMC. All you really got here is a magnifying glass and a lot of gumption. But sometimes, that's all a game needs. While most people are afraid of the term, I think games that are shoved into the blanket term walking simulator have a lot to say and are generally by far the most looked over as people lack any real desire to interact with them beyond the base level of just sort of looking in their direction and going, eh, that looks like a walking simulator. Which is honestly a shame, because with that line of logic, you miss out on the fun and campy experience of the Frog Detective games and the human experiences of games like What Remains of Edith Finch or Firewatch. And by that line of logic, you also start to look at games that are visual novels like 13 Sentinels, which people would just generally look over because people just sort of associate visual novels with games that are about dating pigeons or hot buff dudes. These types of games are all sort of shoved into a genre which is generally looked down upon because people don't consider them real video games, to which I say, that, I don't know, that's kind of stupid. Anything's really a video game. If you, if you want it to be, you, you play it with a controller, it's a, it's a video, it's a video game. I guess what I'm trying to say is, I think people should give more stuff like this a chance. It's incredibly easy to see a visual novel or game like Detective Frog and just assume they have no value because they aren't quote unquote real games or have a hundred hours of gameplay. I, however, think stories like that of Mr. Frog here are amazing little tight knit experiences that I truly hope more people will eventually play because, like it or not, I think we could all use a little wholesome froggy right now. And I also just think in general this genre of video games is just sort of looked down upon because there's not any gameplay or anything like that, which is a shame because a lot of these things that are shoved into this category are a lot more story focused and when they do try to include gameplay it ends up like 13 Sentinels where it's like this mishmash of two different genres that definitely shouldn't be and I mean like Oh god, whatever the hell's going on with Fire Emblem, because that game's just a visual novel that has a bunch of gameplay systems that look terrible and feel awful to play. Uh, just, just make a visual novel. 
it's not it's not that bad, I promise you. Anyway, video games suck and coffee can't stop me, so I'm gonna talk about Evangel- Narrative in games is an incredibly abstract thing, and hey, often not actually that important. Games can be perfectly great with just a basic setup, or hell, even without one, and purely focusing on gameplay is the core nugget of gold in the game. As we creep slowly into the next gen, experiences are only become more advanced and seamless, where we're gonna see developers telling grander, more in-depth stories in their games using lack of load times to play around with transition and pacing a lot more. But saying this, I think visual novels, adventure games, hell, whatever you want to call them, have a vital place in the industry because they share a distinctly laser-pointed vision at what their narratives want to be. A game like 13 Sentinels unfolds its 35-hour saga in a way that I've never quite seen before in a video game, using the basic concept of essentially time and reveals to pretty much bring the clueless player the entire way through the game without any idea of what's going on until the last hour where that singular aha moment snaps into place. And it's fucking rad, and it could not be done if it were a shooter or an open world game or a JRPG. It's just fantastic. Same with Detective Froggy. I mean, it's a series that could be destined to swim in the waters of Ichio forever, but instead has built up a rapid wholesome community, based in part with the weird influx of frog TikToks. But now Froggy can continue telling new tales and even has his own merch line. Games like 13 Sentinels and Detective Frogs live and die on their word of mouth, so friends, I super implore you to try any of the games I've mentioned here today, as that's what I hope happens here on what is essentially the first episode of Coffee Beans, a new mini-series where I recommend you stuff just in bite-sized bits. Just the beans! Heavy narrative-based games may not be everyone's bite of Yoki Saba Pan, but hey, I had to think of some way to link these games together, goddammit. I ain't no detective. He is. <laughs>